So for some of you, it may seem strange to talk about soil in a conference about food. Uh, and the reason for that is because uh, food for us, for most of us, we have created a food culture that essentially sees food as a commodity. So what is, for many of us, we don't even know why it has anything to do with food. And I want you to know I'm not a soil scientist. As you've heard, I'm a farmer. And so I have, uh, but I have the privilege uh, and, the, and the honor of having an association of colleagues and friends uh, who have helped a lot with this. And so I want you to uh, uh, recognize the uh, credits that I want to give for all of the people that have helped uh, in helping me talk about both uh, soil and food. Um, so in this commodity, in, in this uh, food culture in which uh, food is essentially a commodity, uh, most of us, I think, in our culture today simply think about soil as dirt. Uh, it's simply that, you know, black stuff that's out there. And even some of our soil scientists have occasionally talked about soil as simply a material to hold a plant in place. And the way we grow food is everything else that we do, all the synthetic fertilizers that we put in, the pesticides that we use, that's what we use to raise to food. And soil is just sort of there. But in point of fact, soil is critical. And what I want to do this, uh, this afternoon uh, is to help you understand some of that. And at first place, the first thing to understand is that soil is not dirt. Soil is, in fact, a very vibrant, living community. Uh, in fact, soil scientists, though, and some of the things they tell us now is that there are more living organisms beneath the surface of the soil than there are above the surface of the soil. And it isn't just all of the things that we can see, the earthworms and the beetles and the ants, but it is those microorganisms uh, which dominate all of our soil culture. Uh, in fact, as near as I can tell, soil scientists uh, can't even come to an agreement about how many microorganisms there are in soil. I've seen some soil scientists refer to that as 50 million microorganisms in a single teaspoonful of soil, and others have said it could be as much as 2 and 4 billion. So this is a community of life. And if we're going to have not only good food, but any food at all, we have to sustain that community of life in the soil. And so this is one of the things that I want to help us understand today. And so if it wasn't for that community of life, we wouldn't have any food, we wouldn't have any fought, any water, we wouldn't have any of us. And so I love the way Wes Jackson puts this, because not only are we so dependent on all of that life for our life, but as we all know, eventually we return to soil, right? And so the way Wes has put this is that we are simply stopovers between soil and soil. <laughs> and I think it's important for us to appreciate that as we try to come to understand uh, changing the way we eat, because we're not going to change the way we eat unless we recognize what we have to do in supporting our soil. Now, there are a couple of problems with this. And one of those problems is that currently, in the way in which we're producing our food, we are losing our soil at unprecedented rates. Just in the last half century, we have lost about half of our topsoil in this country. And not only have we lost it, but we also have degraded it. A recent study just come out by the United Nations, which has indicated that 25% of the remaining soil on our planet is now degraded. In other words, it no longer has the vitality to produce the kind of food uh, that we've all heard today that we need. Um, and uh, the, the other thing is that soil is essentially not a renewable material. It's not a renewable resource because it has taken the earth millions of years to accumulate this soil. And so unless you want to hang around for a million years, it's going to be very difficult to see this soil that we've lost and are losing restored. And so I want to share with you just about a minute and a half from a wonderful documentary uh, which uh, Deborah uh, Kunz Garcia has uh, put together, which she spent the last four years putting together, and it's going to become released to the public in March of this year, called Symphonies of Soil. And I hope all of you get a chance to see it when it comes out. But John Regenault, who is a soil scientist at uh, Washington State University, has, at the beginning of this fil film, tells us how nature developed and accumulated this soil in the various landscapes. So let's take just a moment and listen to John tell his story. Soils have parents just like we have parents. So they came from somewhere. And soils form from some material that's in a particular location. So in this location, we had windblown sediments that came in, 
and you have these loose sediments that are mostly silt sized particles called loess, L-O-E-S-S, with some clay and some sand, and then soil form. That kind of material is transported. It's transported pear material because it came in by the wind. Other types of pear material can come in by the water. You can have rivers that overflow, like along the Mississippi, they deposit alluvium. Water rushes out of a mountain range, it might drop a lot of material, like in an alluvial fan. When they deposit that material, new soils form in that material. And then we also have glacially transported materials, soils that formed in glacial sediment. When those glaciers melt, they drop the material. We also have soils that are not transported. We have soils that form in place. Right where we're standing now, we're on a butte, kind of an old mountain range. This particular mountain, the soils form from rock in place. It was exposed. After probably a million years, we had a soil that actually formed in that rock. So transported soils, rough to say, I'm guessing 70, 75% of our soils formed in transported parent material. And then another 25% formed in soils that are in place. A lot of those are up in the mountains. Okay, so it's taken billions of years for nature to accumulate this soil. Now, there's another problem, and that is that we're losing this soil now at even faster rates, primarily because as climate change is coming into the picture, we have more severe weather events. So this was what a lot of the landscape looked like uh, in the heartland where we have some of the richest soil in, in the spring of 2008 when we had two weeks of incredibly heavy rainfalls. And this is what we saw on the landscape out there. So we've been losing that soil. Now, we're losing, losing that soil now and it's threatened at a much, much faster rate even than we have in the past. So now, it's easy to simply blame the farmers and say, well, look, you know, the farmers ought to be better stewards. They ought to take better, better care of this. But the point is that we have all been part of creating a food system that puts farmers in a position where they have to do simply one thing, and that is produce as much of the food as cheaply as possible. And so what they do now, what they have been put into a position to do, is to concentrate the animals in one place, as we've heard about earlier today, because that is presumably a more efficient way to produce meat. And our crops are now produced in these huge monocultures because, again, it's a more efficient way to produce food uh, as cheaply as possible. And so the landscape now looks like this. So we don't have any of that diversity that's a part of a necessity of creating that biologically healthy soil that actually feeds all of that living community beneath the surface of the soil. Now, fortunately, you can be tired of hearing me talk about all the problems. There is some good news because we do know that there are alternatives. Um, a friend of mine, Ma, uh, Matt Liebman, who is an agronomist at Iowa State University, has now done eight years of research in which he has simply looked in these research plots as a simple thing. Suppose that instead of having this two-year rotation, this specialized, of just corn and beans, we had a three-year rotation where you have the corn and beans and then you have uh, a, a small grain with clover interceded. And then the clover, of course, is a legume, so it fixes nitrogen in the soil. And it, then you incorporate that rich, green, that rich green plant material as a green manure into the soil. All of that begins to feed that living community in the soil that it needs. Or compared with a four rotation where you have corn and beans and then a small grains with alfalfa and then another year of alfalfa. And what Matt has discovered, if you do that, we could reduce our pesticide use by 97%. We could produce our fertilizer inputs, the synthetic fertilizers, fertilizers by a little over 90%. And the return to land and labor for farmers could actually be somewhat higher than it is in this specialized corn and soybean rotation. And uh, a farmer by the name of Dick Thompson in uh, Iowa has, in fact, adopted some of this kind of diversified farming. And what so soil scientists have discovered, instead of having 18,000 earthworms per acre uh, in, his, in, uh, in, in, in his fields, which are fairly typical, they may sound like a lot to you, but on Dick's farms, there are 1.3 million earthworms. And the organic matter, instead of being a little over 2% organic matter, is now 6.5% on his farm. So we do know some of the things that we need to do. And here's what the difference in what the soil looks like in that two-year rotation and the three-year and four rotation. It's more porous, it has more organic matter, it's that community, uh, that, that uh, habitat that's needed uh, in order to uh, produce uh, the, the kind of food that we need. And then at the Land Institute in Salina, Kansas, where uh, 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 geneticists have now been developing a, a perennial variety of, uh, of grain like wheat and sorghum, et cetera, instead of an annual. 
And if you look at, on the left-hand side, that's the root system from a perennial crop, on the right-hand side from an annual crop. It's much more uh, dense root, root system, goes into the soil 15 to 18 feet, makes the, 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 the uh, uh, plant more drought resistant, uh, and of course, again, does exactly what needs to be done in that soil habitat for all of that living community in the soil. And again, here's the living evidence, the, uh, the, the hand on your right-hand side. And this is incidentally all from the same field. It's just that on the right-hand side is where the perennial crop is being grown. On the left-hand side, where the annual crop is being grown. And uh, again, that, that's the community on the right-hand side that that living uh, 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 community needs. And then we have uh, both researchers and farmers who are now working with winter cover crops. Um, in other words, you know, when you simply use soil to grow food, then you have living plant materials on there for probably four or five months out of the year. The rest of the time, the soil is idle. It's not an ideal condition for all of that living community in the soil. If you put a winter cover crop on there, you have all kinds of benefits. The cover crops take up a lot of the nitrogen and other nutrients in the soil, and they hold it in the plant over the winter months so it doesn't leach off into streams, into groundwater, and off into the, to the uh, dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. But it stays there on the surface of the soil. And then when you go back to planting uh, a food crop again, you incorporate that into the soil and put that, those nutrients back into the soil. And then again, together with some compost, uh, here is what you see happening to the, the, what, the, what the soil looks like when you, have, when you use these winter cover crops. And again, provides that community for all of those living organisms in the soil. And then we have another uh, uh, approach which is using called permaculture, in which especially young farmers are now finding ways to, to, put, uh, to, to regard the, the farm really like an organism, where all of the plants and the animals in the system support each other and, and, and provide the goods and services for each other, which again enables uh, this healthy soil uh, to emerge. And, uh, uh, and animals can perform all kinds of services. And here, for example, turkeys are out there uh, in a uh, squash field uh, eating the insects. And so it takes care of that, so you don't have to have an insecticide. Uh, all of these benefits. And then, of course, compost is absolutely critical in all of these different kinds of approaches. Uh, adding compost and you know, using all of this, you know, 80%, uh, roughly 80% of, of the material that we put out on our curb uh, to uh, have uh, 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 garbage collectors pick up uh, goes into landfills, could be composted and could be used to restore the soil in our own communities. And again, this is what the soil looks like when you do that, when you add that. Now, how are we going to bring about these changes? Well, part of it is the changes are going to come because all of the resources that we use to maintain our current system without paying attention to the soil, like oil, like phosphorus, like rock phosphate, all of these materials, we're, we're drawing down. And as we do, they become more expensive. And as this recent study of the United Nations points out, every time that the cost that we have, that energy that we need to produce that food goes up, the cost of food goes up. So at some point, it's simply going to become unfordable. Now, that's the dark side of what's going to bring about the changes. You probably wouldn't have expected a photograph of chefs in a story about soil. But we now have a new school of chefs that we call the farm-to-table chefs. And they have discovered that the easiest way, the most effective way, to get the kind of taste that they want in the food that they want to serve their customers is by having the food grown in this kind of rich soil. And they are now uh, rewarding farmers, working with farmers to manage the soil this way, to produce the food this way, and to serve it in their restaurants. And then we have a new generation of young people all across this country who want to do this. They want to learn how to manage the soil this way. They want to learn how to produce food this way and to produce the food for those chefs and for farmers markets and for CSA so that all of us can, can uh, acquire it. And then there's that next generation behind this generation, and that's the children. And all across this country now, we're starting to have school gardens. Uh, we are starting to have children uh, coming out to places like the Stone Barn Center, where I'm connected. We have 10,000 children now that come to learn about how to care for soil and how to grow food. And they're going to become the next generation of uh, enabling us to do this. And then there's something that anyone, if you can do, and that individuals are doing, and that is that you can either buy or even make your own compost bin for your own backyard and all of those food wastes in your kitchen and leaves in your yard can be turned into compost and put into your own garden, put on your own lawn. And 
this is one of the most important things that all of us can do and need to do because the most important inheritance that we can leave for our children is biologically healthy soil. It is our lifeline to the future, and every one of us can help to make that happen. Thank you. Thank you.